And this evening's discussion is going to be on grief, a human practice. Uh, not to say that we won't in some ways address it as a Buddhist practice also, but it's it's common to all humans, whether you're Buddhist or not. So we'll just call it a human practice. Gallery up. So going along with the handout, which was in the um, invite, we should have been able to get the handout. Um, I want to make a point at the very out outset that grief is not an illness or a mental health problem. It's a natural part of life, and that's putting Julie Kaplow, though I'm sure I could have gotten it from a thousand other sources. Um, and just to give you an, uh, a grounding, it's a natural reaction to loss. It's a strong, sometimes overwhelming emotion for people. They might find themselves feeling numb, removed from daily life, unable to carry on with regular duties while saddled with their sense of loss. And I think that within this sangha, we've had a number of people who have had deaths of, of spouse, but also folks who have had the deaths of a pet or the loss of a relationship. Any number of things can bring us to grief. It doesn't have to be just associated with the death of someone. Um, and it's the, in the first noble truth is dukkha. And in a very real way, when Shakyamuni Buddha was teaching, he was the first of the four noble truths as dukkha. Grief is inherent in that four noble truths because he talks about dukkha being caused by birth, illness, uh, old age, and death. Now, depending upon how you look at it, at least three of those four things are going to be, be the cause of grief. Uh, and, and depending upon who you are, birth may be the cause of grief too. Uh, it certainly changes your way of life. <laughs> well, not you per se, but <laughs> those you're associated with. And one of the things I, that I want to point out that we often overlook, and I think that people often think of emotions like grief as being part of our ideation system. And Shakyamuni Buddha, and in the Four Foundations of Mindfulness, teaches that the body as the body, and from the body arises sensations, from the sensations arise emotions, and from emotions arise thoughts. And so the very basic teachings of Buddhism is that grief actually arises physiologically, not just through our ideas of our attachment to someone, for instance, a, a loved one who we may have lost. Um, and so we know that in the physiology of grief, that there is a number of health risks that are associated with grief uh, that are well documented. Um, and I was just thinking recently about how well, the shooting that occurred in was it Flooday, Texas? There was a man who uh, his wife, one of the teachers, had been shot and killed, and he died two days later after coming back from her memorial. And, and people people will look at that and they'll say, you know, what was the cause of that? Well, there's a very real physiological basis for that. It's not something that's purely uh, emotions that that changes something. Although emotions are part of that physiological process. Um, and so that we know that there are changes to the endocrine systems, the immune, autonomic, nervous, cardiovascular systems, and that many of the changes that take place on a regular basis are normal changes you know, to all of those systems. On the other hand, when those systems are challenged over a long period of time continuously, they lead to deleterious changes. And that's really what it comes down to. So that we know, for instance, that increased cortisol levels sustained over a long time. Cortisol is one of the um, endocrine uh, hormones that we associate with the adrenal glands, for instance, um, is a major stressor and it's deleterious to health. And it has an impact on the elderly and specifically 
the potential for immune dysfunction. So when we think about the grief that was being experienced by people during COVID crisis, hey Chip, when we think about the when we think about that, uh, Chip's right on time. He's fifteen minutes late, so he's he's just about right. Um, when we think about during the COVID crisis, we had people who were in the process of grieving at the loss of their freedom, their mobility, their social network, uh, a whole series of things. And so when we think on a very real level, that made everyone more susceptible to the COVID virus than they would have been had not those other aspects taken place. So you have the virus itself, but you also have the effects of the immune system, which reduce that. And, and think about the, the, those poor people who had a death in the family and they couldn't mourn properly. They couldn't do a funeral. They couldn't, they couldn't attend their, their loved one while they were sick in the hospital and things along those lines. Um, we often think of grief um, in a way that, that we don't associate with this physical process. So some of the factors that we see with, with grieving are fatigue, feeling tired all the time, nausea, as I said before, lowered immunity, weight loss or weight gain, aches and pains, and of course, insomnia. These are not inconsequential, inconsequential things. Uh, so grief is a stressful event, and it also affects the sympathetic nerves and the adrenal glands in the fight and flight context. So we have the interplay of norepinephrine and epinephrine, which are necessary for normal functioning. Um, and collectively, they're called the catecholamines. They raise your heart rate, they escalate blood pressure, they increase respiration rate, they uh, activate sweat secretion, and there are signs that the body is pumping out ama massive amounts of adrenaline and noradrenaline, and epinephrine and norepinephrine to get into action. The reason we call it the fight or flight syndrome uh, is because that's what happens when you either, when a tiger attacks a person and the person has a choice, they can either punch it in the nose and hope that does it, or they can run away. And those are the two choices that we have when you're attacked by a tiger, unless you're in Texas, at which point you would shoot it. But that's a different <laughs> issue. Um, but that's the, that's the fight or flight syndrome that we see. And that's great. But the problem is that when you're grieving, it's activated all the time. And so that's why it has such a deleterious effect specifically uh, on the, the cardiovascular system. Um, so it shows a profound emotional activation as seen through the hype, the catecholamines, and bereaved individuals have been reported to have increased heart rate, high blood pressure, stress, cardiomy cardiomyopathy, and even sudden cardiac death. And these are all things that have been well documented uh, through research. So what are the stages of grief? And, and I, I suspect that everyone here has heard about and exposed to uh, the stages of grief. Um, and we associate those, they were developed in um, a very famous book on death and dying that goes back to 1969 by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who is a psychiatrist, and she's the person who introduced these. Your feelings may happen in all phases as you come to terms with your loss, and you can't control the process. And, and, and that comes as a real surprise because people think, well, if I know what the process is, then I have some control over it. The fact of the matter is you can't control the process. Mm -hmm. But it's helpful to know the reasons behind your feelings, and all people experience grief differently. Though this particular, those five stages are no longer considered the ideal way to think about grief. You've probably heard about them. And, and, and I, I've, I've taught courses on the, the biocultural process of dying. So I know the literature on how we now rethink um, uh, grieving in ways that are not associated with these five stages. On the other hand, I think that they're still very useful. 
because they provide a framework for us to understand what we're going through uh, in a way that, that I think that the other mechanisms that we use aren't as clear about. The first is denial. When you first learn of loss, it's normal to think this isn't really happening. And you may feel shocked or numb. And this is a temperated way to deal with the rush of overwhelming emotion, the defensive mechanism. Denial becomes a defensive mechanism. The second is anger. As reality sets in, you're faced with the pain of your loss. You may feel frustrated and helpless, and these feelings later turn into anger, and you may direct it toward other people, a higher power, or life in general. To be angry with a loved one who died and left you alone is natural, too. So many times working as a hospice chaplain, I would hear someone say, damn so-and-so, they went and died on me. They left me all alone. They were angry at the person who died. because Now they're the person who's alone. And that's a natural reaction. It's, it's, it's nothing that we should look at and say, how can the person be that way? It's, it's just, how can we otherwise feel bargaining? During this stage, you dwell on what you could have done to prevent the loss. In common thoughts, if only, or what if, and you begin to deal with the try to deal with try to bargain with this um, in a way that again it's just another coping mechanism to see how you might have a, the loss might not have occurred. And in the same way, if we're talking about the loss of a job, you would be doing the same thing. Why did I say that to my boss? Or the loss of of your mobility, let's say. Why didn't I eat better or do exercise or all those things that we know we should do that we don't do as much of? Uh, the fourth one is depression. And this is sadness that sets in as soon as you begin to understand the loss and its effect upon your life. And signs of depression include crying, sleep issues, decreased appetite. You may feel overwhelmed, regretful, lonely. These are all natural processes. And, and I think that, that what I see differentially, and, and, and there's also something about that I have to say here, uh, that is all these things are culturally mediated. Different people from different cultures, different ethnicities, different backgrounds are going to have different responses to all of these things based upon their cultures, their cultures normative understanding of what it means to go through a loss. Some cultures tend to be more stoic. Some cultures, ethnicities tend to be a little bit more expressive. Um, it really depends a great deal on, on our culture. And I think that I've seen a difference just in living in different parts of the United States, a difference in the way people handle the grieving, handle the grieving process in the South versus the North. I certainly saw a difference in the way people handle it in Japan versus in the United States. Um, the last one is acceptance. And this is the final stage of grief. You accept the reality of your loss and it can't be changed. You're be the previous four, somehow there's a part of your mind that thinks I can change this. Somehow this is gonna change. The acceptance level, you, the person reaches the point where they say, I can't change this anymore. Although the person still feels sad, they start then moving forward. Now, every person goes through these phases in their own way. And you may go back and forth between them or skip one or more stages altogether. Reminders of your loss, like the anniversary of a death of a familiar song, can trigger the return of grief. And we've all had those kinds of experiences, I think. Um, every time I watch um, a Mets game, I think about my father, <laughs> <laughs> who was a great Mets fan, and think about his disappointment in me because I was a Yankees fan. And so I go through this whole negotiation process <laughs> with him, you know. Um, Hilda Ross herself never intended for these stages to be rigid framework that apply to everyone who mourns. And in her last book, Before Death, that was in 2004, 
she said that the five stages of grief, they were never meant to help tuck messy emotions into neat packages. They are responses to loss that many people have, but there is not a typical response to, to loss. It's no typical loss. Our grieving is as individual as our lives. And that's a really important thing to remember. Okay, so what's this got to do with Buddhism, aside from the fact that the First Noble Truth addresses it directly? Um, and that is, there's, it's important to understand, first of all, that there isn't necessarily a consensus among Buddhists and scholars regarding Buddhist beliefs about grief. And various sutras and other teachings offer a range of perspectives on the topic. And I'm not going to go over the variety of teachings on grief, some of which I'm highly critical of, and some others I find pretty amusing. What I choose to present is a more standard Tendai perspective. How unusual, right? Mm -hmm. um, when we think that there's something wrong about feeling grief, then we add a second layer. This is a really important aspect of this from a Buddhist perspective. When we think there's something wrong about feeling grief, then we add a second layer of suffering, which is often far more painful than the first. The second layer of pain comes from telling ourselves how terrible the experience is that we're having and we shouldn't, it sh how it shouldn't have had to happen. Except that it's okay to feel the initial pain of grief and you're less likely to add that second layer. What I'm talking about is that often when we've lost someone, lost a job, whatever it may be, we don't view it as the natural outcome of a life. Somehow we, there's a part of our brain that shuts off that recognition that, it's, that change is inevitable and that somehow we could remain free from that. And that's when we begin to feel that, how could this be happening to me? Well, it's going to happen to everybody. Unless you choose not to get close to another person, then it may not happen. That, that's possible. So if you want to go live in a cabin in the woods and have no connection with other people, but then you're going to feel grief when you get up in the morning and your back is sore and you, you know, there's all kinds of things that go on. There is a Buddhist story. I, I feel it necessary to really ground this in Buddhism in a very real way. So there's a Buddhist story that expresses this idea that I just mentioned. And everybody will know this. Well, not everyone. Most people will have heard this story. There was a young woman. And when her only son was one year old, he fell ill and died suddenly. And she was struck with grief. And she couldn't bear the death of her only child. So weeping and groaning, she took her son's dead body. She's literally dragging her son's dead body with her um, from one house to another. And she begged all the people in the town to bring her son back to life. She wanted medicine to cure this child who had long since died. Of course, nobody could help her. But the young woman would not give up. Finally, she came across the Buddhist who advised her to go see the Buddha himself, Shakyamuni Buddha. And when she carried the dead child to the Buddha and told him her sad story, he listened with patience and compassion and then said to her, there's only one way to solve your problem. Go and find me four or five mustard seeds from any family in which there has never been a death. The woman was filled with hope and she set off straight away to find such a household. But very soon she discovered that every family she visited had experienced a death. Once she accepted the fact that death is inevitable, she buried her child in the grief, grieved only then the death of the child. She realized that she was not unique and that she had not been singled out by God to, to this fate. She understood that surely as life comes to all of us, death comes to all of us. The other aspect of this story is that through sitting with other people who had been had lost a loved one physically going to their houses, she didn't feel alone. She realized 
that she was within a community of people who cared. Because how could anyone not offer solace and condolences, et cetera, to someone showing up with a dead child and expressing that? So grief is an expression of love. And grief is how love feels when the objects of our love have been taken away. And that's worth bearing in mind. So try to be aware that grief and seeing it as valuable because it is love. Without love, there would be no grief. But without grief, there would be no love. So we have to see grief as being part of the whole package, so to speak. And gratitude is a necessary component to the healing. The ways we choose to show gratitude can affect the healing process and how we take action in making the decisions to heal. Gratitude helps bring together the past, present, and future to help close the gap between you and your suffering. The feelings of, grat of gratefulness you carry with you can stem from many different experiences and memories left behind. Let me provide some common sense instruction that spell the myths of grieving. I didn't write these down. I ran out of room on the page. The pain will go away for faster if you ignore it. That's the first thing. If I just ignore the pain, if I pretend it isn't there, which is a form of denial, then I'm going to, uh, the pain will go away faster. Trying to ignore your pain or keep it from surfacing will only make it worse in the long run. For real healing, it's necessary to face your grief and actively deal with it. In Buddhism, we refer to it as being with one's grief. Second myth, it's important to be strong in the face of loss. No crying, no weeping, not that, don't do that. Feeling sad, frightened, or lonely is a normal reaction to loss, and crying doesn't mean that you're weak. You need to protect your family or your friends, but you need not protect your family or your friends by putting on a brave face. Showing your true feelings can help them and you. The next myth. If you don't cry, it means that you're not sorry about the loss. Crying is a normal response to sadness, but it's not the only one. Those who don't cry may feel the pain just as deeply as others. They may simply have other ways of showing it. I vividly remember when my, when my father died, I didn't shed a tear. I never cried at my father's death. And having on death and dying, having actually been trained by Elizabeth Cooper Ross for years, I realized that that was a natural process. However, I still felt like, why aren't I crying? You know, I felt like there was something that was, that just wasn't the way that I showed the emotion regarding my father because the relation, I mean, my father and I had a good relationship. So it wasn't that, that, that we, we had a, a conflicted relationship or something like that. That was with my mother, and for her, I cried. But my father, we were fine, in spite of the fact that he was a Mexican. And so, you know, even though you know these things, doesn't mean that you're not going to feel in some way as though I'm not doing this right. That's, that's a very common uh, feeling. The next one is grieving should last about a year. I've heard so many people say to me, Oh, what's normal for grieving? It's about a year. And I think to a large extent, we get that from some of our religious traditions in Judaism, for instance. You're supposed to mourn for seven days of Shiva. Then you mourn for another month in which you're not permitted to go to a movie or concert or something along those lines. And then, But for a year, you're still supposed to keep a low profile, not do things that are, you wouldn't go on vacation during that year, for instance, if you're, if you're Jewish. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not to say that Judaism in any way had dictated that's the period of time you're supposed to grieve. I think those rules, so to speak, those, those guidelines were set actually to provide a person with a way of grieving. That doesn't mean that it's limited to a year. For some people, the grief may last for several months for others, the grief lasts for uh, several years. In fact, this feeling of loss is, might 
in fact, never go away. And that's not unusual. It's just that the, the um, emotive aspect of it diminishes somewhat over time. But as we said before, you know, a song can bring those emotions flooding back, um, being someplace and, and looking at a beautiful sunset or something like that, and then saying, I wish so-and-so were here to see this. That's a normal process. And this can go on for uh, quite a while. The last myth is moving on with your life means forgetting about your loss. Moving on means you've accepted your loss, but there's not, it's not the same as forgetting. You can move on with your life and keep the memory of someone as an important part of you. In fact, as we move through life, these memories can become more and more integral to the defining who we are. And I think that that's important to, to recognize. In summary on this part, community, love, and gratitude are all components to better coping with loss of a loved one, loss of our health, ending a relationship, whatever it happens to be. It's important to see oneself as part of a greater whole and our life and our loss is the obverse of all that we have experienced. Gratitude for what we have had and a sense of living with the knowledge that we are not now, nor have we ever been totally alone is really important in coming to grips with, with grieving. So thank you. And I'll open it up to questions and answers. So we're gonna once you go to the next uh, yeah. next slide. I couldn't resist this guy. He just, you know, he looks like he's got a question. He sort of reminds me a little bit of, of Chip. I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, so we're gonna we're gonna unmute everyone and um, see if you've got some questions or some comments or some thoughts. Looks like a photo wants. Oh, you you had something you wanted to ask. Uh, oh, are you addressing me, Coho? Yes. Excellent. Okay, I wanted to ask about uh, if you could address the grief that comes from, for a, for example, the environmental crises uh, that we have, and and the fact that it seems as though uh, I, I know several people personally who deny it. Uh, uh, I know people who deny that uh, uh, guns are a problem. I and, and this uh, causes a, a type of grief. I, I think that there's two parts to what you're saying. It's it's not to say that people don't deny the environmental crisis. People deny the violence that is caused by guns, etc. But then there's the grieving over the environment. Uh, which I think I I am certainly one of, and there's the, again. I, as a matter of fact, during the Dharma talk, I'm going to address the grief that we've experienced in the last uh, several weeks with the with the violence that we we had, and that grief I think is when I talked about the physiological process. I have to tell you that what there are things that you can do with that grief that you wouldn't necessarily want to do with the grief, for instance, of the loss of a loved one. So when we're grieving things like uh, the, the environment, the, the environmental crisis, when we're thinking about the grief of the people who had been lost in Buffalo or the people in Texas, et cetera, it's really good in those cases to actually step, put it aside for a while Meditation, for instance, um, in which you're not really concentrating on those things can be really valuable. Whereas if you've lost someone who's close to you, that same meditation could be to thwart the normal grieving process if you try to, to walk away from it. It's not just, and, and, and what I'm saying is because there's a logical component, you want to, at times, 
recognize that physiologically you're being harmed and it's a good idea to find a way to mitigate that effect. And so um, breathing exercises, sitting meditation, doing those things, not in any way to forget those things, but to allow your body to recover a little bit so now you can you can respond more effectively. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess uh, also related is uh, how do how how does a bodhisattva deal with uh, what they deal with? It's amazing that they encounter such a person of that uh, type will will take on so much grief and pain and uh, how yeah. how. <laughs> All I have to say is that Abu Kitsabara has a therapist. <laughs> I'm just being facetious. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Oh, Joe, please. Uh, can you comment on the uh, not exactly grief, but um, how do I put this? The practice uh, of a uh, morning period and how that helps people to uh, go through liminal process, right? Live, uh, losing somebody is like also experiencing amputation. You and uh, it's very difficult to come back to a normal life if there is anything like normal life. So in what? How long is the period of uh, mourning, um, if there is a formal you know, aspect to it? And then in what way going through that process helps a person to uh, restore a certain degree of normality, according to Tendai Buddhism? Well, I, I think that we, we have to recognize that there are rituals in all religious um, traditions, all faith traditions, there are rituals and I was speaking before about Judaism, where there's Shiva, and then there's a month, and then there's a year. Uh, the, the, put the memorial on the grave after one year, for instance. That, that is the end of the formal mourning period. Um, and, in, and in Buddhism, in Tendai Buddhism, we have the 49 days that one experiences the, the period of, of becoming from this lifetime to the next lifetime. And that 49 days is broken down into seven, seven day, or yeah, seven, seven day periods, for instance. So in that context, you have um, a kind of ritualized mourning, which assists a person because I think it, um, there are sort of a kind of milestone along the way in which the person has an opportunity to reflect on the loss of the person and get back in touch with the with that loss in a way that if they just leave it wide open, they don't. And one of the things that I really regret, um, it, you know, during during COVID, we really couldn't have funerals and memorial services, for instance. And that was really very painful for a lot of people. Um, aside from the the obvious, it didn't give them an opportunity to go through some of those periods. And I think that one of the things that I do see also are people who do not have a, a spiritual tradition that they relate to in some way, they often will not have um, services. They won't have a funeral or a memorial service or something along those lines. And I think that the and and and, and some of the people who died will say, I don't want to have a funeral. I don't want to have a memorial service because they feel like I don't want to be an imposition in some cases. But I think that at the same time, that doesn't give the people who have been left behind after a death an opportunity to mourn appropriately. And so I think that that's one of the things I see as being really, really difficult. And I would, I would agree with that completely because you may recall when we had Philip's memorial here, it was in that little that little window of time in the summer of 2020 when COVID was, this is before pre-vaccines now, um, COVID was at a very low time. And 
Well, we were only supposed to have maybe 50 people here out of the tent outside here. And when you and Lois officiated at Phillips um, Memorial, there were 135 people here. And I think it, it wasn't just for Philip. No. You know, I think it really was for all the people that everyone had come. I think very much that that, that memorial became you know, a, a, a memorial for many. And I, and I have to say, you know, in comments of what you were saying, I, you know, I've read all of the the Ross and many other, um, many other, um, <coughs> well, and, and I, this, I agree with Jan Richardson, who is one of my, been very helpful to me, um, a poet, artist, writer that, that, I, that I've read a lot of in the last two and a half years. And she says that grief is like the least linear thing that she knows, and I certainly agree with that because you can, you know, you can think that things are going very well, all of a sudden it's not anymore. And she said, you know, it could be like a kind of a house with many doors, and you open one up, you just don't know whether behind it there's going to be a treasure or an explosion, you know, and it can be, it can be like that, and. Um, Another thing that she has said is that you know there really is no moving on because you're not you can't go back to who you were because the person that you know I will never be the person that was because I was half of a oh of you know of, of, of you know I was half of a couple and that couple doesn't exist anymore so I cannot be who I was I, have to be. I can't hear you. <laughs> But she was she was just saying that, that she recognized that she can't be the person she was before Philip died because she was part of that whole and that whole is no longer together. That was the that was the last thing. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Oh, actually, he's been here before. Yeah, so he knows he knows the drill. <laughs> Thank you, though. Um, we have uh, Ralph uh, and Mushin. Uh, we'll take two quick ones because again, a little bit late. Why don't we take Mushin first and then Ralph? Mushin. Yeah. So it was very helpful uh, to me to put my wife's ashes in the columbarium and to have a service with that. Really let me get in touch with my grief uh in a very uh real way uh so i thank you for that thank you and Ralph, for you're me for me it's easy to like just pass over the grief and get on with business well, we do have to stop which is not good yeah, yeah. that's important uh, Ralph, you have your hand up. Uh, yes. Um, I think one of the things, and this is just a comment and wanted to add this to, and that is that the grief doesn't always start at the time of the loss. Uh, my mother was a good example of this. My mother sent a letter out to my sister and I uh, telling us that she had uh, uh, had her cancer turn, turn up again. She had had breast cancer and about 20 odd years later, uh, it, it turned up again, it metastasized into the bones. And she sent us a letter saying what was going on. And I remember distinctly that that's when uh, I experienced the, uh, the stages of grief, the denial and anger and so on. Uh, 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 she died uh, oh, about six, eight, uh, 10 months later. Um, uh, and at that time, I didn't have the grief anymore because, and not because I didn't have it, but because I had it at the beginning when she sent the letter to us. Um, and so sometimes it, 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 you experience it not when the actual loss occurs, but when you find out that it's going to happen. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Thank you. And I'm good. Ichishima Sensei, is there anything that you would like to say before we move on? Because I'm going to have the people who are in, in person go into the hondo in a few minutes. 
Are there any final thoughts that you have? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, the uh, such a mo morning uh, that is uh, forty nine days. That is uh, written in the Abhidharma Kosha by Bas Bandhu. Uh, <laughs> epistemological studies. He he wrote that uh, uh, when one uh, <laughs> dies, then soul goes to uh, the remains in the house during forty nine days, and uh, after forty nine days, uh, they go to Kannon, uh, Abrakteswara's place like that. And according to the Japanese uh, tradition, uh, <laughs> Buddhist side, 49 days, this is morning period. And the uh, Shintoism, that is over, over 50 days. So uh, this kind of uh, customs, we have it. So many people ask me, uh, how long should we mourn the person who passed away? Well, the Buddhist, Buddhism, 49 days. The Shintoism, 50 days. <laughs> that, that is my comment. Thank you. <laughs> it's all prescribed. You know, on the 51st day, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sensei. And now I'm going to ask the, the folks who are in the uh, room with me here to go on over to the hondo, and I'll be moving into a different position. And this evening, Shumon is going to be in the hondo, and I'll be in the Zoom. This evening's discussion on grief came out of the grief I've been experiencing for the last several weeks. It started with the racist massacre in Buffalo, New York, and continued with the horrible slaughter of children and teachers in Valde, Texas. And I prayed and borne witness to these acts of violence. And keep in mind that over the holiday weekend from Saturday through Monday, there were an additional 15 mass shootings that occurred over that weekend. But it seems that it hasn't really ended there because I'm grieving for a country and its people that seem to have lost the capacity to rein in the butchery. A country that's lost its moral core. One of my greatest fears is that we, people with a sense of conscience, will become so numbed to the slaughter of human beings that we are no longer shocked and disgusted by these wanton acts. One of the coping mechanisms that people have when confronted with carnage is to disassociate themselves from the blood and gore, the sights, the sounds, the smells. Do we remember how outraged we and shocked we were in the massacre in Newtown, Connecticut in 2012, almost 10 years ago? It would be 10 years in December. In the intervening years, what has been done to mitigate these human-made disasters? Mass murder after mass murder taking place in all parts of the country. Last Wednesday was the two-year anniversary of the murder of George, George Floyd by people who had taken an oath to protect and defend. Let's put that into context. Being killed by gunshot is the leading cause of death in black men under the age of 44. Think about that. Being killed by a police officer is the sixth leading cause of death in young black men, over two and a half times more likely than a young white man being killed. We seem to be more concerned with about the war in, in the Ukraine by sending them arms and munitions to defend themselves to the tune of $54 billion than we feel about the violence that's occurring in our country. And it's not that I don't support what we're doing for the Ukraine. I absolutely do. But how can we we, we find it appropriate to send the money there to protect the Ukrainians or to at least assist them in protecting themselves 
from the Russians, but we don't feel obliged to do the same for the children in our schools. How much have we spent to eliminate the killing of our school children and the people who are targeted because they are people of color? I also grieve that we're having this conversation that is taking our focus off the environmental crisis that is upon us. Think about that. We're having this conversation instead of how are we healing the planet? I have no quick solutions. And I have a feeling of emptiness and sadness. Like the grief we feel for the loss of a loved one, we must allow these emotions to make us, we should not allow these emotions to make us complacent. We must be productive in some way to heal our broken hearts. I think about this in a similar way to the people who were abolitionists in the 19th century who saw slavery and said, what are we going to do about it? We have to be like those abolitionists. Writing letters to the editor, telephoning your representative, supporting political candidates that address solutions, having constructive conversations with friends and neighbors are things that we can do. Do not do nothing. If you are complacent, you are complicit. Svaha. And I'll move us along. From Lao Tzu, life is a series of natural and spontaneous changes. Don't resist them. That only creates sorrow. Let reality be reality. Let things flow naturally forward in whatever way they like. 